Well, good morning, everybody. That was a great worship set, wasn't it? Praise the Lord. You can clap. Absolutely. As you are going about your weekend and doing what a lot of people do on Memorial Day weekend, which is planting flowers and having barbecues and meeting with family, I want to encourage you to remember this day, this weekend, that many have gone before us and have paid the ultimate sacrifice for their lives. We remember that so that you and I could be here today and worship freely. What a, what a privilege and blessing it is that we can gather freely without fear to worship Christ and celebrate what he's done for us. Victory over death, hell, sin in the grave through faith. It's a beautiful thing. My name is Jeff Falkowski. I am the director of Young Families and also discipleship here in the church. Recently, Dr. Youssef asked me, and sometimes the way Michael asks is a little bit stronger than I ask. <laughs> he asked me on three different times in one different meeting if I would take on the responsibility of focusing on Wednesday night prayer. Wednesday night prayer has been a very important ministry in the life of this church. I took it very seriously. I prayed about it and felt the gentle nudge and tug of the Holy Spirit to say yes. And so this August, I will be directing my gaze towards that. And so I thought that I would preach on corporate prayer today from the book of Acts. So not individual prayer, but corporate prayer. And we're going to take a look at a picture of powerful prayer from the book of Acts. So if you have a Bible... We can turn it open to Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 23 and then go to verse 31. Again, Acts chapter 4, verse 23 to 31. Hear the word of the Lord. On the release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voice together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servant to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. This is the word of the Lord. So I want to frame this picture a little bit to give us historical and also scriptural context to this passage. You might remember this is at the beginning of the book of Acts and the church was constituted by the Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost after Jesus had worked his earthly ministry and finished the work the Father gave him to do. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. And then he ascended into heaven after having spent a significant amount of time proving that he indeed had risen from the dead, sat down at the right hand of the Father, showing his wounds and his hands and his side and his feet, his head forever wounded in heaven, our Lord and Savior, making intercession for us. Today, if you didn't know, if you're a liturgical kind of person, today is actually Ascension Sunday. It's very significant that Christ ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Because the great vision of Jesus in heaven is that he is the Lamb of God. 
The lamb who was slain, that's whom John, John saw when he looked up into heaven in the book of Revelation. So when the father sees the lamb that was slain, he sees that his blood was spilled for you and for me and he paid the penalty for our sin. Aren't you grateful for that? But not only that, Jesus and the father sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in you and me. And as the book of Ephesians says, it's a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Guaranteed, friends. That's Louisiana for a guarantee. <laughs> We're guaranteed. And so the church, as the book of Acts says in chapter two, is, is doing quite well. The Spirit's poured out, Peter's emboldened to preach the gospel. Men and women are cut to the heart because they rejected the Messiah that God had sent to them. They repented of their unbelief. They were baptized. They were filled with the, with the Holy Spirit. And the church went out and began to proclaim the gospel and thousands of people were saved. What an incredible, incredible act of God was happening. The disciples in Acts chapter 3, specifically Peter and John, they go up to the temple to pray as was their habit. They run into a, a man who was disabled from the time of birth and he asked them for silver and gold. They said, I, we didn't bring any with us, but what we do have... We, we give to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They pray for him and he's healed and they use that opportunity to proclaim the good news of the gospel, Christ for you for the forgiveness of sins, which is a gift from God through faith. More people come to believe in Jesus and all of a sudden what happens? They live happily ever after. <laughs> no, actually what, what happened was is that we have a real enemy. And when the church is growing, when the church is focused on the things that, that, that God wants us to focus on, right? The apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, which is communion. Why is communion so significant and important? Because what are the words of institution in communion? This is my body, broken for you. This is my blood, shed for you and for the many. For what? For the remission of sins. It's a visible presentation as we remember the work and ministry that Christ did for us on the cross. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They spent time with each other, living together in community and friendship, supporting in one another, praying for one another. And they devoted themselves to the prayers. And so Satan wanted to disrupt this, this little and growing church. He wanted to stop it. He wanted to get them off track. And so what did he do? He stirred up the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the ruling leaders, the Sanhedrin. That was the political and the social and the religious rulers of Israel of the day. And they told them that you must stop preaching in this name. Stop it. Stop preaching the gospel. Now, Satan will let us do a whole lot of other things, get involved in a whole lot of good activities. But if we focus as a church upon the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ for you, for the forgiveness of sins, if we focus on that proclamation of truth, calling people to repent of their unbelief and believe in the truth of God's gospel for them, oh, he'll raise up against us. He, he got the political leaders. He got the social leaders. He, he got those people who were in power to say, no, we're going to pass a law. You don't say anything in that name anymore. Now, how did they respond? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look. The first way that they responded, we can read in verses 23 and 24. We see that they respond with powerful prayer. And powerful prayer happens when we pray with our community. You see, Dr. Youssef, when he started this church, he wanted Wednesday night prayer. He called it the hour of power to be the powerful engine that drove the ministries of this church that kept the gospel of Jesus Christ central to this church. Because he knows and I know and we know that apart from Christ, we can do no thing. We're called to be his instruments. And as we begin to pray together for his word, for his purposes and his plans, according to what he desires, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and not the things that will be added, but seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, then all these things shall be added unto us. And so here's what they did. Look at verse 23. They're released from being arrested, from custody. And Peter and John went back to their own people. They went back to their people. They went back to their church. 
And they reported what the elders and the chief priests said to them. And when they heard this, they started political active groups. They wrote on blogs. They went to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram to, to voice their displeasure. They tried to leverage their influence with Sanhedrin in hopes that they possibly might change their mind. They sought out Herod so that he could overrule the decisions that were being made by the Sanhedrin. They went to Rome and Pontius Pilate so that he would use his military might to get what they wanted. Oh, wait a minute. That's not in my Bible. What is in our Bible? What, what does the Bible say? When they heard this, they prayed. They raised their voices together in community. They raised it to God. Why? Why, why did they do that, friends? Because why do you go to a lesser power Amen. to seek relief and help when you can seek the most high? Amen. Amen. And friends, we, we, we have to come to this space where we gather together in prayer and we seek God knowing that he can accomplish what he purposes, that his word does not return void, but it will do what it says. Do you believe in God's word today? Yes, amen. That's what I like to hear. I, I, I have to fire myself up to get in God's word and believe him because I'm telling you, we have an enemy that wants to stop the gospel from going forth and get us distracted by all other things except the gospel. The gospel is the power of salvation unto all who believe, first for the Jew and then the Gentile. Let's not be ashamed of it. Let's not put it in the closet. Let's not try to do other good and moral things that make things happen. Let's focus on what God empowers. And what God empowers is that his gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, would be preached to a lost and dying world and that they might be healed by his stripes. Amen? We, did this, we need to do this together in community. We need to, to rededicate ourselves to gathering together, to pray together, and to believe God's promises are true and that he can accomplish his purpose and stop being distracted by all the noise that's around us. Friends, the most important thing that we do when we pray is that we join our hearts and minds together in unity, right? They prayed together. They prayed together. I've been a part of so many prayer meetings and it seems like we're pray when we pray, we're so disjointed. Somebody's praying for a concern that they have about something that's happening on the West Coast. Somebody's praying about a concern that they're having at the office. And God cares about all these prayers. Of course he does. But when, I, when we begin to really take seriously the plans and purposes of God in our prayers, God loves to move and answer those prayers that we pray his will be done and his kingdom come like Jesus said, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father. Many years ago, I was a part of a church planting team in southern Siberia, Russia, just above China and Mongolia. And we were invited to come in and to do some church planting among an unreached people group called the Eltai. And we went into a city of 70,000 people that, listen to me, had no church and one known Christian. 70,000 people. Anthony, that doesn't happen in South Georgia, does it? <laughs> so, so, so we get there and we, we had been praying and planning and, and, and preparing our hearts to go to this place for several months. And we, and we get there and we go into the city and we meet with the mayor and we meet with uh, all the city officials and they say to us, you're not welcome in our city. And us Americans were like, okay, well, I guess we got to figure something else out. And that was our attitude. But the young lady who had been praying, Tanichka or Tanya, she, she called a prayer meeting. She said, come on, let's, let's pray about this. We serve a God that holds the hearts of kings in their hands and can direct it like a water course as he so pleases. And we gathered together and we prayed for maybe 45 minutes to an hour Nobody was really shouting or jumping up and down or binding or loosing. We just prayed and said, God, you're sovereign. You're in control. You control the hearts of kings. You can direct them the way you please. Lord, we know you want your gospel to go forth into this city. We know that you can do anything that you want to do. We trust you with it. And I'll never forget after about an hour of prayer, Tanichka said, okay, that's enough. It's like, okay, well, if you say so. The next morning she calls us and she says, okay, we can go into the city. And we said, what happened, Tanya? 
And Tanya said, well, the KGB happened to call me. The KGB. And they told the mayor to stand down that these people were coming to help our city. And they gave us a pass into the schools, into the factories, into the university that was in that city. And we went around and preached the gospel and planted a church. And many Altai people were saved. Now check this out. That was back in the early 90s. In 2015, my wife and I went back to do ministry in southern Siberia, and I had the opportunity to go back to Gornaltaisk, and that church was a thriving church, and they had planted 13 churches among many unreached people in that part of Asia. The, amen? Because of, because of prayer, y'all. Because Tanya didn't go to other powers, she went to the Most High and she invited us to join her to go to the Most High and to seek him and his purposes and he was pleased to answer those prayers. Powerful prayer. Look at verse 24, the second half of it, where they say, Sovereign Lord, but I'll read the whole verse for context. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in unity and they prayed to God, Sovereign Lord. They know who has the power. They said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. I often hear people say, oh, we just got to use our authority. Friends, can I just say something? That's, we don't have any authority. I I know a lot of people go to Luke and they say, oh, well, you know, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And I give you authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. You've ever read that passage of scripture? And then he says, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. See, here's the thing. Jesus gave his disciples specific authority at a specific time to accomplish a specific purpose, his purpose. It's not like we sit there and pray and try to bind and loose and and make things happen. No, we are not agents. We are instruments. We are vessels. And we're trying to yield to the Lord and say, Lord, what's your plan? What's your purpose? I don't have authority, but God, you have authority. Just like Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Very little authority has been given unto me. What? what, Some authority has been given to me. No, oh, I thank you guys do read your Bibles. I'm, I'm grateful for that. He says, all authority has been given unto me. Now, because this authority has been given unto you, you go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I shall be with you always. God is with us when we are doing his work according to his word, according to his methods, according to his ways. Amen. And that's where our authority comes from. Our authority comes from God. They're using the language of scripture. You might know that Psalm 135 verse six says this, says the Lord does what he pleases. We ought to put that in our, in our, in our memory bank. The Lord does what he pleases in heaven and on earth, in the sea and in the depths. That means everywhere. And friends, if there's anything that we need to start doing is we need to start putting ourselves in that place where we're yielding to God's word, where we're yielding to his authority and where we stop thinking that it's up to us. It's not up to us, it's up to God. And we are called to yield to the Holy Spirit that we might be filled and empowered to do what he wants to do. And that's for the gospels to go to every nation, every tribe, every language, every kindred, every tongue. And not be distracted by all these ancillary things. And some of these things are good things. I'm not saying we shouldn't be involved in other activities. We all have a vocation from God. But in that vocation that God gives us, in those volunteer things that God asks us to do, we are called to hold up the word of God, namely Jesus Christ. Jesus is the incarnate word of God. Hold him up high that he might draw all men unto himself. And so... Friends, they understand that he has all authority. And we need to come to that space where we recognize that that authority in God comes 
to us as we yield to him and do his purposes. The third point I want to talk about comes from verses 25 to 27. Powerful prayer happens when we pray according to God's word. Listen to what they say in in verse 25 to 27. They quote scripture. You spoke by the Holy Spirit. Guess who wrote the scriptures? The Holy Spirit. Through the mouth of your servant David. This is Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. So this is really significant because what are they doing here? They're getting the worldview of the Bible. And can I say something? I think a lot of what's happened to us in the church is we've taken the worldview of the world and we've used the world's methods and the world's ways to accomplish God's purposes. And it just won't work. Think about what the the apostles initially thought Jesus came to do. He came to kick, tail, and take names, right? To ride in on 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 a steed into Jerusalem to drive out the Roman invaders, to clean up the immoral and the corrupt priesthood, and to sit there and to destroy all his enemies. Because that's what they thought of this psalm, that David was going to come in and, and ride in, somebody that was going to ride in, and he was going to do that. But guess what, guess what happened? That didn't happen, did it? This is how Psalm 2 was, was fulfilled. When Jesus ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God, that was his coronation day. And Jesus uh, in heaven, what does it say about him? What's the revelation of Jesus in heaven when John was lifted up in John chapter five? Behold, I saw the lamb in the center of the throne as if he had been slain. What was the first proclamation of Jesus when he started his earthly ministry? John the Baptist, his cousin said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, by the way, the book of Revelation also says that Jesus was the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. Friends, Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. When God... When they wanted to see God the Father, the disciples, what did Jesus say? Have you been with me so long, Philip, that when you see me, you don't know that you see the Father? Friends, think about how incredibly merciful and kind God is despite the very people who crucified him and sinned against him and murdered him and mistreated him and plucked out his beard and spat in his face and tore his clothes off him and made fun of him and gambled him and mocked him and said, come down off the throne and we'll believe in you. You could save others. Why can't you save yourself? Gave him some foul wine to drink and and absolutely stabbed him in the side and did all sorts of incredibly horrible things. And one of the last thing he says is this, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Let me be honest with you. If it was my way, the way I can be in my sinful flesh, I wouldn't put up with people's stuff. I would just destroy them. (laughs) Aren't you thankful that God's ways are not our ways? Because he goes on to say in verse 11 in Isaiah, he goes on to say, let him return to the Lord. Let him repent and return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. Do you remember Jonah? Jonah? Jonah was so excited to go to the Ninevites. He couldn't wait to get there. (laughs) Jonah was a prophet of God and he knew the character of God. And he knew when God was calling him to share the, 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 call them into repentance 
and to, and to, and to come to know the one true and living God, he knew that once, he, that, that once they did that, they, they were going to repent and he didn't want it. So he ran as far and hard as he could. And he so desperately didn't want his enemies to repent and be saved. And let, let me tell you about the Ninevites. These people were so immoral, I'm telling you, they would probably make the immoral people that we know in our culture blush. I don't think you understand how pagan these societies were. I don't think you realize how far gone they were. What they did publicly and in worship would absolutely astound you if you've studied anything about ancient Near Eastern culture. I can't even talk about it in church. But listen, Jonah hated them and he didn't want them to be saved so much so that he threw himself over the side of the ship in an act of committing suicide. And honestly, listen to me, folks. I think today that we've gotten to a place where we hate our enemies so much, we want God to just destroy him. We want to tell God, this is who you need to put in power. This is how you need to act. This is what you need to do. Do it my way, God. Do it my way, God, because obviously I know I'm right. I've read your word and I understand it perfectly. No, friends. God is a merciful God. He doesn't want anyone to perish. 2 Peter 3 and 9 says, God is not slow, as some understand slowness, but he's patient with you. He's patient with me. He doesn't want anybody to perish, but all to come to repentance. Listen to me, aren't you grateful that God didn't bring the consummation of all things before you met him as Lord and Savior? Amen? Should we not have the same heart for the nation's for our nation, for our culture, for all the people that, that they don't know what they're doing. God has a people that he's calling to himself and we are called to share the good news of forgiveness through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we ask them to repent of their unbelief and believe in the good news of the gospel. Jesus said, I will build my church and he builds it on the gospel and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Powerful prayer happens when we recognize God's sovereign will. This is an amazing passage of scripture. It, God's sovereignty is so amazing. <laughs> I just, he freaks me out sometimes. I'm just being honest. I don't know, but does anybody ever get freaked out like when they read about God and they're, I mean, is, isn't God amazing? Listen, listen, listen to this. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together, okay, these evil guys with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire, right? They're conspiring against the sinless, holy son of God. Like they're going to, they're, they're going to trump up charges against him. They're going to put him in a kangaroo court. They're going to falsely accuse him. They're going to falsely convict him and they're going to immorally murder him and crucify him in the most painful, worth, incredibly difficult death somebody can die in that age. That's what they, how evil is that? Is that evil? Can't be more evil than that. You're, one of your closest friends betrays you with a kiss of all things. Listen, it goes on to say, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. What? What? How could that be God's plan? God, what man means for evil, God means for good. We are living in very difficult times. But you know, I've read about this in my Bible, haven't you? Like there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, famine and pestilence. All these things, nation will rise up against nation, right? Haven't, you, haven't we read this somewhere? Isn't it somewhere in the Bible? Didn't he tell us that, that kings and rulers are going to rise up against God and his anointed? They're, they're going to reject his message? Why, why, do, why do they reject the message? I'm going to tell you why. Our sinful nature doesn't want to receive a free gift. It's that simple. That's what happened in the garden, friends. God gave everything in the garden to Adam and Eve freely, except one thing, and that one thing they had to take. And they reached out and they grasped it. It's the one thing 
that they couldn't receive as a gift, they took for themselves. And that's what humanity wants to do, save themselves. Haven't you heard AI today? They're starting to talk about that they can upload our consciousness and we can live forever. How ridiculous. Friends, the message is that Christ died for you and for me. He is for us for the forgiveness of sins. It's a total gift from God that we receive by faith, which is a gift in and of itself. It's all gift. Our God is a delightful gift giver. Have you ever read his parables? He's always inviting people to a party. Isn't that amazing? It's like, come on, I'm going to have a feast. Come and show up. I'm going to prepare it all for you. I'm even going to give you the clothes to wear. It's going to be awesome. And people say, no, I've got better things to do. And he keeps on inviting, and he keeps on inviting, and he keeps on inviting. I'm going to tell you this right now. Nobody's going to go to hell without tripping over Jesus, the bloody body of Jesus, in their attempts to get there. That's how gracious our God is. Yeah, Peter didn't get it, did he? He didn't get that God was sovereign, that he, he wanted... He wanted Jesus to do things his way. When we align our prayers with God's sovereignty, those prayers become efficacious. They they come effective when they're aligned with God's plans. Peter had a prayer one time to the Lord. You might remember. The Lord said, Peter, I'm going to go be crucified. I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of evil men. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to rise again. And Peter said, that's a great idea, Lord. Let's do that. He said, no, no, Lord, far be it. I will not let that. I will not let that happen. You ever pray like that before? The Lord said, oh, thanks, buddy. I'm glad you really brought me to my senses. He said, get behind me, Satan. You don't have what's in the mind of the Lord, but what's in the mind of men. When we begin to pray more along the lines of what's in the the Lord, that's how we know we're going to be empowered and we're going to have the feeling of his Holy Spirit to accomplish his purpose. See, friends, the gospel, this this is how you know the end's coming. Check it out. You can look at the signs all around you all day long. You can watch all the television shows and buy all the books and, and you can think you have it figured out. This gospel will be preach to all nations. Here's, that's the condition. And then the end will come. Lots of preaching needs to still happen. Lots of sharing of God's good news needs to happen. So if you think Jesus is right around the corner, he could come back today. Well, he's going to have to preach the gospel to every nation today. And by the way, oh, he's chosen you and me to participate in that. So we better get moving. <laughs> Amen. All right. So powerful, this is the last point. Powerful prayer results in God's power being manifest in the believer's lives. Here's an amazing thing to me about this passage. Absolutely amazing. Do you notice their lives are being threatened? They're being commanded not to preach the gospel. And they don't pray, Lord, please protect us and keep us safe. We can't go out and share the gospel. It's too dangerous out there. We might lose friends and family members and may, maybe even our job. Please, I and mean, I know these are real things. I'm not trying to belittle these pressures. These are real pressures. And I, if you're in a job in a difficult situation right now where, where you're being persecuted, my heart goes out to you. If you have family members that are rejecting the gospel, the good news, make sure they're rejecting the gospel. Do you understand what I'm saying? The good news of Jesus Christ. Sometimes people are rejecting other things like, hey, you better get your act together, then come to Christ. That's not the message of the gospel. So they don't pray for for their safety or for their rights or for God to change the Sanhedrin's heart. They pray, Lord, listen to what they pray. Consider their threats and enable your servant to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name, not through us, in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the meeting where they were praying, it was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. 
I don't, I, this is, can I just share my heart with you? Just peel it back just for one more minute. Here's what I think God's doing to us as evangelical Christians. We have put so much of our faith into our power, into our political persuasion. We put so much of our faith into our cleverness, into our ability to create environments and moods. We put so much of our faith into our social media presence and all these different things we have. We put so much of our faith into institutions and into personalities, so much of our faith into all these different things and God is saying, enough. Do not put your faith in personalities or institutions. Do not put your faith in your power and your ability to get things done. It's time to put your faith back into the one and true and living God, the one who is only able to change the heart of any man, woman, or child, and start praying and believing that the gospel can do the work that it's been doing since Christ Jesus was risen from the dead, ascended on high, sent forth his Holy Spirit, and filled us with the Spirit that we might be his witnesses even to the end of the earth. Amen? Let's not be distracted because that's what Satan is trying to do. He's trying to get us off the main thing and we've gotten off the main thing and it's time we get back to what God has called us to get it back to, doing things God's way, doing things according to his purpose, his plan, his word, his will, his kingdom come, his will be done and let it be done for his glory and our good and that all people might know that Jesus is Lord. Amen? Amen. We need to repent of these things that we put our faith in and put our faith back into Christ and Christ alone. I repent. I have sinned. It's not about human wisdom or human power. Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. We preach Christ and him crucified. Foolishness to the Gentiles and folly to the Jews. But to those who of us who are being saved, Christ is the wisdom and power of God. Hallelujah forever and ever. Amen.